It's my privilege to introduce to you again Dr. Mitch Glazer, President of Chosen People Ministries International. Been with, uh, with us since uh, 1997. Good friend, excellent speaker. We enjoyed him last night. You learned about his life, and uh, at least part of it has some other stories, but uh, uh, this was the revised version I think we heard last night. But he cleaned it up a little. But, uh, you know, we, it, uh, I don't know how he does all the things he does. He really is an inspiration to us because he stays busy. He's leaving this afternoon uh, to go to New York, London, and Kiev. Uh, there is a conference over there he has to attend, and that's uh, part of his life. But we are pleased to have him. I count him a privilege to have him as a friend. And uh, most of all, I think that uh, he loves the Lord. And that comes through. He's passionate about what he does. And um, he keeps us all going with that passion. It's contagious. So if uh, you don't know this man, you get to know this man. Uh, unfortunately, we, you won't have too much time today to know him. But uh, we appreciate uh, all he does. Uh, I encourage you that... Uh, if you have questions, like we said last night, make sure you write them down and put them in our box. We will make sure to answer those. Uh, I encourage you also to get CDs, audio CDs of the presentations or DVDs. This first year we are uh, videotaping the, all this. So we're excited. And if we don't have them ready by the end of the conference, we will uh, send them to you. So please help me to welcome Dr. Mitch Glazer. Thanks. Some of you who don't know me but see my picture, I don't mean to scare you with the beard. <laughs> uh, but I, I decided that at this stage of my life, I need the more prophetic look. <laughs> now. now, just a couple of things. I don't, I'm not usually uh, uh, self-promoting. Uh, maybe I am, but try not to be. Uh, but we are entering the high holiday season, and so I do want to encourage you that years ago, Zahava, my wife and I, actually Zahava wrote most of it, wrote a book on the fall feasts of Israel, and we're coming up on the fall feasts. So if you've not read this book, if you haven't really studied through the fall feasts, I think it would be a great blessing to you. And make sure you read the last chapter, because I had written that to my mother. And uh, it, it's an evangelistic chapter. Uh, at the conclusion of the fall feast. So I just want to encourage you. I know Janice usually pitches, and I don't usually pitch, but, uh, but if, if you go ahead and, and get this book, you know, I'm sure that Jorge will sign it for you and forge my signature. So. <laughs> <laughs> Worth more on eBay. Now, now, also, you, you'll see me referring to my iPhone. I just want to assure you I am not texting or doing my email, okay? But Nahama walked in, and she said, I'm going to check you out in, your, in my Hebrew Bible. And so I said, oy vey, okay? <laughs> and so I have my, my Hebrew up here, okay? And just to make sure that I'm doing the right thing. So last night, we began our journey through Isaiah chapter 52 and 53, one of the great servant songs of the Hebrew scriptures of the book of Isaiah uh, that points so dramatically to the person and work of our beloved Jesus, Yeshua the Messiah. And so this morning I invite you to open your Bibles to the 52nd chapter of Isaiah. I understand that Luba will be putting stuff on the screen behind me and uh, also will be letting me know how much time I have left. So I now... <laughs> I hope the sign is bigger. <laughs> Luba, that's like an eye test. Let me go, let's see, what, what was that? Okay. Yeah, that will, that will work great in youth meetings. And so, um, I've got to move this up a little bit because it's not really working, is it? No. Not at all. 
So why don't we put it over here? That way I don't have to stare at it. Uh, so last night I shared a little bit about my, my story and, and how uh, God used Isaiah 53 to touch my life and how God used Isaiah 53 uh, to uh, touch other people's lives. I wish God had used Isaiah 53 to touch my mother's life, but I will tell you this just as a brief update that uh, she passed away about six years ago, and before she died, uh, we do believe that she became uh, a follower of Yeshua. We're not 100% on that one, but we're pretty clear on it. And the way it happened, of course, was, was not through me or not even through my wife, not even through her grandchildren who love the Lord. But uh, when she uh, was stricken with cancer, and, uh, eventually she really weakened through chemotherapy and so on, and so she needed a home health care attendant, so of course God gave her an on-fire, born-again Haitian Baptist. <laughs> named Dominique. <laughs> and it was really through it was really through Dominique's ministry of serving my mother and holding her hand and so on that right before she, uh, she died. And it's interesting, uh, you always need two people when you're doing a hospital visit with a Jewish person. You know, you, you always need two. You need one missionary to divert the family <laughs> and one person to talk to the sick person. Okay, so remember that, okay? And so, uh, so I was diverting my sisters, and, uh, and my wife and, and Dominique were talking to my mother, and my wife asked my mom, uh, do you believe in God, mom? Now, I would never have done this, because I didn't want to know if she, if she had said, if she didn't say no to me directly, I could always hope. So I didn't want to know. I would never have asked. So, but my wife did. And so, do you believe in God? And my, my mother smiled, and, uh, and then they asked, and do you believe in Jesus? My mother smiled again and, and squeezed her hand. So, you know, uh, I would say that's the best we could do, except I know a little bit more, because three nights earlier, when she was still very much alive, but uh, uh, still on a morphine drip, but very much alive, she bolted up in the middle of the night. My sister and I were staying in the room with her, and uh, she bolted up and cried out, God help me. And I read the scriptures to her and prayed with her and gave her the gospel again, as we had before. And she laid back down after that and uh, went back to sleep in peace. And uh, the presence of the Lord filled the room that night in, in a way that I'd rarely, really sensed in my entire 40 plus years as a believer. And uh, I, I knew it was true. You know, sometimes, Things happen spiritually, and you're the only one that see it, you know. But then sometimes other people see it too. And so my, my, my uh, unbelieving younger, 10-year younger sister, who I adore, uh, was uh, after my mom went back to sleep, she looked at me, and I, I can't tell you the language she used exactly. She looked at me and said, what was that? What is that? What was I feeling? And I said, well, sweetie, that, that was the presence of God. You know, and so she hasn't become a believer yet. Uh, but I have a lot of hope for my two sisters and for all of my nephews and so on. So I hope that they will see uh, who Jesus is through Isaiah 53. Last night, we suggested that Isaiah 53, as a servant song, because there were no chapters and verses in the original, we suggested that it started at verse 7. Verse 7. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. But Hebrew word bashar, which means to proclaim good news. And, uh, and so we realized that the good news is one word in Hebrew and actually one word in Greek. And uh, in the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, and then again in Romans chapter 10, Rabbi Saul, the Apostle Paul, translates the term as evangelion, which is the word for gospel. So the gospel is good news. And then we looked at some of the attributes of the good news. It brings us peace. It makes us happy and beautiful. It talks about salvation and reminds us that God is in control. And so these are all wonderful results 
of the good news, but we still didn't know from the text what the good news really is. And so we come this morning to answer the question, what is the good news? Because if we're going to share it, we really need to know what it is. And, uh, and so I don't want to spend a lot more uh, time in uh, some of these verses, but I really uh, need you to look at, at verse 10 of chapter 52 for a moment. The Lord has bared his holy arm. Uh, I think it's kind of neat, and, and I don't want to make an, a big deal out of it because I don't think we should, uh, but just for some of you who, who know about this stuff and celebrate Passover, you know, the, the word there is zeroa. And of course, we know that the zeroa is the shank bone of the lamb that we use at Passover. And of course, we know that Yeshua is the lamb of God, sacrificed, in a sense, before the foundations of the earth. And, and we, a lot of us who talk about Passover raise the shank bone of the lamb and say the zeroa, it points to Jesus, the lamb of God. I, re I remember my first Passover as a believer. And again, I told you about my mom laid down the rules about who I could talk to and who I couldn't talk to. And first on the list of who I couldn't say anything to were my grandparents, her parents, who are very, very Orthodox Jewish people. And so my first, I was just, I was a believer, really not even a year, and I was back in New Jersey, and we headed off to Brooklyn for Passover at my grandparents' house. And, uh, and of course, I wanted to tell everybody about uh, Jesus. And there I was with all the, we say, the Gansa Mishpucha, the large family. So everybody was there. And, uh, and I, was, I was well behaved, you know, through the first couple of cups. <laughs> you know, and uh, parsley, you know, not much you can do with that, really. And, and a little horseradish. But, you know, then my grandfather raises the Zoroa, and, you know, and uh, tells the story of Exodus 12 about the 10th plague where God told the Jewish people to take a spotless, unblemished lamb, shed its blood into a basin, and put the blood on the lentil in the doorposts of the house, and then God would pass over and spare the Jewish people who were protected by the blood of the innocent, perfect lamb. You know, and uh, he's raising that lamb, telling the story, and I knew what it referred to, and, and I sat there like this, mm. <laughs> the Zoroa is Jesus. It's Jesus, you know. Well, the truth is, the Zoroa is Jesus. And so the Lord has bared his uh, Zoroa Kadosh, his holy arm. The, and, um, and so uh, the Zoroa, Zoroa is Jesus, but you definitely cannot prove that from this passage, so don't try. Uh, but, it, but, it help, but it gives us some insight. But the next part of the verse is, in some sense, is even more important to me. The Lord has bared his holy arm in the sight of all nations, that all the ends of the earth may see the salvation of God, of our God. And so we understand from this servant song that even though it's should I do something? Okay. That even though it is primarily directed to the Jewish people, underlying all of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, the entire Old Testament, I believe is built on the foundation of the Abrahamic covenant, where God said to Abram at the very creation of the Jewish people that you would be a nation, that you would have a land, and that ultimately all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. And so even though God gets more and more narrow and specific and focuses on his chosen people, remember the Jewish people were chosen for a reason, for a purpose, not to simply enjoy salvation and keep it to ourselves, but to be God's vehicle, God's bridge of blessing and salvation to the entire world. You can't understand the entire book of Isaiah, nor the Bible, without understanding that. And so, smack right in the middle of this passage about the Messiah of Israel, who would die for the sins of the Jewish people, is the important truth 
that this would be for the benefit of all the nations, call Hagoyim. Now, when we get to verse 13, 14 and 15 of chapter 52, we come to what I call the executive summary. summary. So this is really the way Hebrew narrative is often written. You kind of tell them what you're going to tell them. It's almost like a good Southern Baptist preacher, you know? <laughs> uh, you tell them what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, then you tell them what you told them, and tell them what to do with it, you know? There you go, homiletics in one sentence, okay? And so, uh, but this is very typical. It's a uh, uh, Hebrew narrative. It's, there's a summary statement. You, you know this is true. Uh, you remember this passage? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And how many of you know that? Okay. And what book is that in? No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Okay. So we know that, that that happens. And then you have a couple of chapters giving the details of the summary. Now, this is opposite of the way we do things, okay? because the Hebrew Bible is Jewish. It's Hebrew thinking, okay? We are Greek, even if we're Jewish. We still think Greek, okay? And so we're more inductive. We're, uh, it's, there's this reason, and there's this reason, and there's this reason. Therefore, we give the conclusion, right? Okay. It's opposite. Jews write things, we do it right to left. We start with the conclusion, then we get to the details, okay? So it's a little bit, a little bit different. So we start with the conclusion, and we start with this. So in this summary, in verses 13 through 15, we have everything that's going to be detailed further in chapter 53. Okay? And I find that a lot of people know it's in 53, but they don't really investigate and unpack verses 13 through 15. So I'd like to have you look at that with me, because I think it's a great blessing. So now, if indeed you were waiting for it, three points in a poem, or uh, some other proper uh, uh, preaching style. You know, I graduated cemetery, uh, seminary a long time ago. Okay? I now, and I, I teach in our chosen people, Feinberg Seminary, which is affiliated with Talbot on the West Coast uh, in, in New York City. And so, uh, so I feel now that I've graduated a long time ago, and I'm teaching at a seminary, I can now I now do not have to follow the rules of preaching. Okay. And, and so, uh, actually, the more Jewish way of preaching is kind of more narrative, and you kind of stumble through the text, and then when you, you're interested in something, you stop and talk about it. You know. And so that's what I'm going to do. And one of the things I love about that method of preaching is that the text drives you rather than a pastor's or a preacher's outline. You can think about that a little bit. And it depends on your view of the Word of God. So I'm not saying that those who do it the other way do not believe that the Word of God is supreme. I just want to make sure that we all know that what this is about is not the stories and illustrations, but about what God has to say in His Word. Okay? So uh, I'm just going to read and stumble and stop. Okay? So let's begin. So behold, let's stop there. All right, you're with me then. Good. So, Hine, behold, pay attention. Isaiah said it a little bit differently in chapter 6 at his calling in that incredible vision where he was taken into the throne room of God and uh, angels were swirling around him. And one of them, the seraphim, the uh, messenger of fire, took one of the coals. Uh, drenched in redemptive blood and touched his mouth and purified him. And then the, the voice came and said, Who will go for us. us? Very good. You're a smart group. Who will go for us? And then Isaiah said the very same thing that Abraham said before he knew what we, he was saying. And what I used to say when my rabbi said, Menachem, are you here in Hebrew school today? And I would say, yes, but I wasn't. And what did Isaiah say? Isaiah said, Hineni, here am I. I'm, I'm here. Lock, stock, and barrel, mind, body, soul. I'm here, I'm available, I'm ready to go. And then he tells Isaiah to go and preach to a people who won't hear. And then I love his response. So how long should I do that? 
<laughs> Remember that? I love it. He says, God says, until everything's destroyed. You know, great, great. I mean, talk about, you know, I, I lead a mission, so I have to measure impact and results because we have missionary employees and all things like that. So everybody always says, how do you measure results? I said, well, it's sort of in an Isaiah sort of way, you know. <laughs> you know, if they're really doing their job, then no one's listening. You know, and, uh, you know, but we, we all, we're so married to evident success, you know, that sometimes we forget that we need to base what we believe, how we do things, on the Word of God. Yes. Okay? Not that we don't want to be successful, but I have a feeling God's idea of success is slightly different than ours. Yes. Or else both Isaiah and Jesus were dismal failures. So if they're failures, I want to fail. Okay. So behold, pay attention because there's something really important. There's something that is even going to be hard to grasp. I need your full attention, Isaiah says to whoever he's speaking to. Behold, my servant, the servant of the Lord, the Hebrew word eved, my servant will prosper, which is why I want you reading the New American Standard and not the evil NIV. Because, Nechama, it does not do justice, justice to Yashkiel. Okay? It doesn't translate it properly. And, uh, and so it takes me ten more minutes in my sermon to explain why they translated it like that. Just trust me. Okay? So, my servant will prosper which is a ridiculous thought because the only way to become a servant, which is the same word for slave, the only way for an Israelite to become a servant is to become broke. You lose the farm. And you indenture yourself to another Israelite, and hopefully they'll treat you well, help your family survive, and then if you like them enough, after six, seven years, you know, you think about it, you put a little earring in your ear, and then you decide to follow them for the rest of your life as long as they take care of you. It's very hard to work your way out of poverty in ancient Israel. It's, it's an, almost an impossibility. And so the, in the truest sense, in the meaning of the term, okay, even though I know, understand it's used differently, but in the meaning of the term, a servant in the Old Testament was poor. It was poor. And, and even though Isaiah is even using this somewhat metaphorically, he also has a, an understanding that a servant of the Lord was poor. Okay? That's why he uses this sentence to juxtapose it, to say this is unusual. So we've got a poor person, a slave, who gets rich. Do I have your attention yet? Okay? We have a poor person who should be hopeless, who prospers, not just financially, but in every way. And of course, the reason the NIV says act wisely is because it was always a wealthy Israelite who sat by the gate and dispensed wisdom and was respected as a sage in Israel. And so the truth of it is, is this slave, this servant, who lost everything, will get everything back. And so immediately in this executive summary, you have the two faces, the two images of the Messiah. One image, poor. One image, rich and prosperous. How do you put the two together? Now, that's important in Jewish evangelism, not to steal Jorge's thunder, but maybe to add a basis for it. You know. And so the, in Judaism, even though in ancient texts, you do have both a dying Messiah and a kingly Messiah, although I have to admit that most of the rabbinic material is about a kingly Messiah, and that the humble Messiah or the dying Messiah is not as uh, uh, obvious. If you want more details on all of that, read Mike Brown's chapter in the Gospel according to Isaiah 53. He goes to town on it. Okay, and it's a lot of great information. And he quotes all of these rabbinic texts. Okay, but I don't have time. And so you have two images of Messiah. 
Uh, just to give you a, a feel for what Jewish people really believe about the coming of Messiah, uh, my wife, who's uh, uh, originally from Argentina, uh, was uh, raised in a Jewish community, was very, very poor. And uh, she was raised uh, in a very Jewish home, both parents Jewish, not believers in Jesus. And, uh, and so it reflects the common understanding of, of, of what they Jewish people believe the Messiah will be. So uh, Zahava will tell the story that she always asked her mother for two things, a dog and a bicycle. And the Jew, her mom's response always was, don't worry, honey. When the Messiah comes, you'll have a dog and a bicycle. <laughs> it's kind of like, for Jewish people, the coming of the Messiah is like the ultimate Hanukkah. <laughs> you know, everything that we can have for our lives, he's going to come and bring us, you know? He would win any election. <laughs> and so, uh, that's the common understanding. So there's not a common understanding that there are two faces to the Messiah, nevertheless two comings of the Messiah. Jewish people believe Messiah will come, he will reign as king, he will bless Israel, will have peace, the dead will be raised, everything will be made straight, and your Jewish friend will look you right in the eye and say, how could you believe Jesus is the Messiah when Israel is not at peace, people are still suffering, the dead obviously haven't been raised, so he can't be the Messiah. And your response is going to be, let's look at Isaiah chapter 53, because in Isaiah chapter 53, your prophet talks about a different version of the Messiah. A dying Messiah. A humble Messiah. And there are actually not two Messiahs, but we believe there's one Messiah who has two sides to him. And it's mentioned at the beginning of the text. So, behold my servant, will prosper. So you have this slave who's going to be, who's going to prosper. Isaiah says he will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. The last time Isaiah used that phrase, he used it in chapter 6, and he used it of God. He was in the throne room and he said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and greatly exalted and his, his train, his robe, filled the temple. You remember that? And so now, not only do we have this poor servant who will prosper, now we understand he will be highly exalted, lifted up, almost like God himself. This is a very interesting servant. And just as many uh, were astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man. The Hebrew word for marred also implies disfigurement. And so the path from humility to exaltation for this servant of the Lord would be one of great difficulty because he would be fig, uh, disfigured and marred. Starting to sound familiar. And then verse 15, thus he will sprinkle many nations. Now that's one of those phrases that make you want to read a psalm and say that now you like the Old Testament, you know, because Psalms are easy to understand, you know. He will sprinkle many, what in the world does that mean? You ever read prophetic literature and say, I just don't get it, you know, maybe I'm the only one. He will sprinkle many nations, what does it mean? Well, Isaiah borrows a Hebrew word from the early chapters of Leviticus. And you actually see this word used over and over again in Leviticus chapter 16, the Yom Kippur chapter, the Day of Atonement chapter. Why? Because it doesn't speak of sprinkling water. It actually speaks of the priest who kills the bull and the goat, puts its blood into a basin, and then in that one day a year, pulls aside the curtain separating the holy place from the holy of holies. And he walks into the holy of holies with the basin of water and comes, uh, of blood, and comes face to face with the ark and the mercy seat and takes the blood of the bull and the goat and sprinkles it on the mercy seat. It's interesting that uh, Paul 
calls Yeshua, Jesus, God's mercy seat in Romans. And so the high priest sprinkles the blood, the atoning blood, on the altar to make propitiation for our sins. Thus, he will sprinkle many nations. You see, the servant of the Lord is going to sprinkle atoning blood on God's heavenly altar for the forgiveness of sin for the Jewish people. Isn't that what it says? Read your text. Oh, the nations again. You guys, you Gentiles keep creeping in. You know you're wild branches. You need to behave. So again, we learn that God's plan of redemption is not limited to the Jewish people, first for the Jewish people, but it was always to include all the nations of the world. In fact, I believe that verse 15 is the Old Testament version of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave in sacrifice his only begotten son that whomsoever believes in him will not perish but receive the glorious gift of everlasting life. A bit of a paraphrase. And so the atoning work of the servant of the Lord was not simply for Israel but for all the nations of, of the earth. And so let me recap. So you have a servant, a slave, who should stay poor. But instead, the servant will prosper. He will be raised up, highly exalted, in a similar way that God himself was. But on his way from humility to exaltation, he will be marred and scarred and disfigured. And then ultimately, he would provide a sacrifice of atoning blood for both Jews and Gentiles. I love the next line. Kings will shut their mouths. <laughs> I, I, I love it. I love it. You know, it. Now, we know that the word there refers to Gentile kings because it's in the plural. If it was in the singular, it would maybe refer to a Jewish king because Jews only had one until the kingdom split, then we had two, but one of them wasn't, was illicit. See? So Jews only had one king, Israel, Israelis only had one king. So the kings, the Gentile kings of the world will shut their mouths. They'll be astounded by this servant of the Lord and perhaps even by his followers. What they had not been told, they will see what they had not heard they will understand. I really understood this a couple of years ago when I went to this missions conference in South Africa, in Cape Town, sponsored by the Lausanne Consultation on World Evangelism. And there were 4,000 plus delegates from countries throughout the entire world, and there was a little Jewish contingent uh, of us as well. And uh, everybody was supposed to dress the first night in kind of their national dress, you know. And so uh, I'm a New Yorker, so I wore a suit and tie, you know, and, <laughs> which wasn't as colorful as the Africans, honestly, you know. And, uh, and, and everybody was in there t together. And then I began meeting some of these people. And uh, one of the most moving persons I met, I met a lot of people that have been, were in and out of jail because of their faith. I met a lot of people from Sudan and other places, and Egypt, where you know, you know, they were, they were either in jail, out of jail, or one foot away from martyrdom, you know? And, uh, but it was the 25-year-old Iranian guy that I met. And I said, uh, and, and it was at this conference that Communist China, by the way, forbade the 200 delegates from coming in, and then they jammed the Lausanne website. That Red China, they jammed the website. We, could, we were supposed to be online. They jammed it for three days until we figured it out. I mean, they were angry and sophisticated. 
And so I met this Iranian guy, and I said, uh, so what do you do? He said, well, you know, I, I have a little ministry in, uh, in, in, in Iran and so on. I said, so, wow, you can get away with that. He says, no, not really. <laughs> and now there are a lot of Iranian believers. But the fact that there are a lot of Iranian believers doesn't mean that there are going to be a lot of Iranian believers that are still alive in the next few years because many of them are, are losing their lives. And so I said, how'd you get out? He said, it's a miracle. So I said, what happens to you when you go back, assuming they know where you were? He said, it's in God's hands. And I walked away from that conversation. I said, and I thought I had it rough in Brooklyn. <laughs> this guy's, he, he's going to die because he went to a conference to be with other believers or end up in jail. I mean, and the kings of the earth shut their mouths because those who follow this servant of the Lord who gave their li his life for them, they are willing, even though they might be good citizens of their countries, if there's a conflict of interest between heaven and earth, they are willing to pay the ultimate penalty of death and sacrifice out of loyalty for their heavenly king, who they couldn't even see. What would a potentate, a king of the earth, say to something like that? The answer is nothing. It's so impressive as a testimony. So now Isaiah asks a good question in verse 1 of chapter 53. And if you don't read the previous verses, you don't understand it. So now in 53, Isaiah says, who in the world would believe any of this? You expect me to believe that a, a, a servant will prosper and that uh, uh, he will die for the sins of the world and so on? Uh, who has believed our message? And he goes on and he says, and to whom has the, what's the Hebrew word? Zeroah. Okay. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And then he begins a description of the human characteristics of this individual. Like, he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of parched ground. He had no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. So there was nothing about this individual that would be humanly attractive to anyone. And so he would not have a charismatic personality. Uh, he would, you know, I look at a lot of religious leaders uh, today, you know, and, you know, forgive the, forgive the comment, but, you know, he probably wouldn't have his own television show. Not that everybody who has one is uh, doing something wrong, but, you know, he probably wouldn't be making a lot of money on books like, like I am, you know, and uh, there'd be nothing special about him, it, you know, nothing to draw us. In fact, verse 3, he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we didn't esteem him. So the God of heaven took on flesh not only endured our frailties he, uh, without sin, but he endured our rejection. I mean, he could have come to earth, you know, maybe as a, a king of a small country, you know, or, or something like that, maybe a governor, you know, but he came to earth in complete humility as the servant he was, and he was despised. Verse 4. He was surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we thought he was stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Verse 4 is the turning point. In verse 4, it seems like whoever is singing the song now recognizes that the truth of the matter is, is that there was nothing wrong with him, but that there was everything wrong with us. And that what he was suffering for was not what he deserved, but rather what we deserve. Now, the question is, when is this song sung? I don't know if it's true, and Isaiah doesn't tell us, and nowhere else does it tell us, 
But some old commentators uh, have said, uh, in Jewish evangelism especially, have said that this Isaiah 53 will be the song that the remnant sings right before they cry out, Baruch haba b'ashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, before Yeshua returns. Zechariah 12.10. And is that true? I don't know. But whenever it is, I want to see it. <laughs> but there is a turning now, a recognition, a beginning of the repentance process. Because repentance really is a process, isn't it? It's a process of realization that you were wrong. And so it begins now. So our griefs, he bore. Our sorrows, he carried. Yet we thought he was the one stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. The Hebrew word, therefore, smitten, is a word that's often associated with someone getting leprosy. And so in the Talmud, there is actually uh, a section, uh, Sanhedrin 98b, where there are names of the Messiah discussed, and one of the names for Messiah is the leprous one. Why the leprous one? because of Isaiah 53. In fact, I was living in Brooklyn when Menachem Schneerson, who was the worldwide founder and director of the Lubavitch Hasidic movement, very aggressive uh, movement, some of you are familiar with, with it, very mystical and so on. Rabbi Schneerson did miracles. If he put a hand on a dollar bill for you, your business was blessed. Uh, people were healed in his name. And you know, who knows? You know, did a lot of these things really take place? I would say probably yes. Were they by the power of God? I would say which one? <laughs> Remember the priests of Egypt. So I don't know. I'm not saying he wasn't a good man, but he was deceived and deluded. Just like a lot of us. But I remember when the Lubavitch were handing out tracts, at Brooklyn College, I was handing, about, handing out Yeshua tracts, and they were handing out Schneerson tracts, you know. And I couldn't believe my eyes. They were actually quoting from Isaiah 53, saying that Isaiah 53 was fulfilled in Menachem Schneerson, and he was the leprous one who was bearing the sins of the Jewish people. I never in my life thought that would happen. David Berger, who wrote one of the original anti-missionary booklets in the early 70s with Michael Wishagrad, uh, David Berger, who teaches history at Yeshiva University, wrote an entire book excoriating the Lubavitch movement for using Isaiah 53 in this way because, he said, you're falling into the hands of the missionaries. So there is a teaching within Judaism that there would be a leprous one, and, and don't let it be lost on you. It wasn't lost on the Jewish people. They understood that we were not talking about the physical ailment of leprosy, but rather they were comparing leprosy to sin. One eats away at the physical body, the other eats away at the soul. And so there was... An, and understanding that this person would become all of these horrible things for us. And somehow, everything that would be leprous about us, uh, everything that would be sinful about us, would be embodied in him, and he would bear our sin, our spiritual leprosy. He goes on. Verse 5, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. No doubt the word pierced means it's one of the Hebrew words that imply that someone's dead. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. Isaiah does a study now in words for sin because he uses a lot of them. And this is the Hebrew word that really refers to rebellion. So he was pierced through for our rebellion. He was crushed for our avon, iniquities, which literally means crooked or bent. 
So if you compare our lives to the straight line of the Ten Commandments or of the Torah, you and I, every single one of us, are crooked and bent. We're all crooks in one way or another. So he was killed for our rebellion. He was crushed for our crookedness and the chastening for our well-being, basically the Hebrew word shalom, the chastening for our peace fell upon him. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, the very heart of sin, but the Lord has caused the iniquity, the crookedness of us all, again, to fall on him. It's almost like Isaiah says, got it now? You see it? This servant of the Lord, who should have remained poor, who would be high and lifted up and greatly exalted, who would be marred, scarred, and disfigured on the path from humility to exaltation, who would shed his blood as an atoning sacrifice for the entire world, this person deserved none of this. This person bore our sin. Everything that we deserved, he received. Everything that he should have received for his righteousness and goodness, we received, though we didn't deserve it at all. I always told my kids, and I'm sure you've done the same, in a negotiation, you know, I said, don't ever ask me for what you think you deserve. <laughs> don't ever say to God. You know, you realize... And, and because of what happened over the last few days, and some of you know about my friend dying, and it was seemingly so unfair. Unfair. Listen, accusing God of being unfair is the wrong thing to do. You want a fair God? You know where that puts you? <laughs> so... Everything we deserved, he received. Everything he should have received, we received. He deserved it. We received it. That is not unfair. The Bible has another word for it. Grace. It's grace. I know God's riches at Christ's expense is not the most messianic, but, you know, it works. It works. I think the commentary on Isaiah 53 that's most profound is found in 2 Corinthians 5.21, penned by Rabbi Saul, the Apostle Paul. He said this, He made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Has that been your experience? I hope so. Do you mind living on borrowed righteousness? You'll never have enough of your own to deserve salvation. Actually, you'll never have enough of your own to even deserve to be blessed by God. It's all a gift. We're so sinful. He gives it to us. Because for some strange reason, he loves us. Well, he goes on. This is very important. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth like a lamb led to his slaughter, like a sheep silent before its shearer. So he did not open his mouth. I hope this will be covered when you look at the New Testament. And Isaiah 53, I'm not trying to tell you what to preach, Ben. Uh, but, <laughs> but please don't avoid uh, what Peter has to say about these things. And, uh, but, you know... He, Peter replies this and tells us how to suffer. Then verse 8, By oppression and judgment he was taken away. As for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? Very important passage for evangelism for understanding this text. Uh, I was, again, I was at Brooklyn College. You might say, Mitch, why so much Brooklyn College? Well, number one, I was born in Brooklyn. Chosen People was founded in Brooklyn. I live in Brooklyn, and there are a lot of Jews in Brooklyn. And so I was, one of my ministries is, over the years has always been at Brooklyn College, which is where all the Orthodox Jews send their kids 
because they either can't afford Jewish parochial school yeshivas or because their kids are a little rebellious and better they go to Brooklyn College and stay in Brooklyn than leave and go someplace really, really ungodly like Harvard or something like that. And so they keep them in Brooklyn. And so one Friday afternoon, I was at a book table and uh, talking to students and so on, and uh, there was a, a, a Lubavitch rabbi next to me. And, uh, and he was talking to students. And we struck up a nice little conversation. And he was witnessing to me, and I was witnessing to him. <laughs> All things are fair in love and God's work. And so, and so we were both witnessing to one another. And, you know, it started getting late. It was Friday. So, you know, he, he had to get back for Shabbat, and I actually had to get back for Shabbat. I had a Bible study in my house. And so, and so we, were, we walked down the street together, not quite arm in arm, and continued, <laughs> continued the conversation. And we were all over the map. I mean, it was really getting late. It was like 5.30, and uh, it was starting to get late. And so we had to end it. And uh, finally, uh, I mean, we, we talked about every single thing. Uh, the October Chosen People newsletter, which you will see, will be all about the incarnation and why Jewish people do not believe Jesus is God and why Jewish people should believe Jesus is God. And the, at the heart of the, uh, of the uh, uh, volume will be an article by Mike uh, Brown uh, taken from the uh, book out there, uh, The Truly, Really Kosher Jesus. And it's very, very good. So we were talking a lot about that. Could God become a man, which is a big Jewish problem, and back and forth. And then we were talking about Isaiah 53. And finally, I looked at him and I said, Rabbi, if you could prove to me that Isaiah's people were anything but Jewish, I will stop doing what I'm doing and I will become a Lubavitcher. He looked at me, really? I said, absolutely. If you can show me that Isaiah's people were German, were Scandinavian, Italian would be nice. You know, you just, you just let me know, and, and I will give it up. He says, why is that? I said, let's look at one more passage in the Tanakh. We had a, a, I had a carry-along Tanakh, you know. And we looked at, I said, look at verse 8. He will be cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of whom? My people. Who's writing this? Isaiah. Whose people are Isaiah's people? So who is the servant cut off for? So if he's Israel, how can he be cut off for Israel? Does that make sense to you? Doesn't make sense to me. How can it be referring to the nation of Israel? Then it would be the nation of Israel is cut off for the nation of Israel. Some rabbis argue, well, it's the remnant of Israel cut off for the rest of Israel. I said, that's not what the text says. I said, an odd, and, and that's an odd interpretation. And so the rabbi's looking at this, and I said, do you, do you understand my problem here? I would like to believe you, but the Bible contradicts what you're saying. And ultimately, we both know that if the written Torah contradicts the oral Torah, we're supposed to go with the written. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little more complex for most rabbis, but, you know. Uh, but I said, it, ideally, that's what you're supposed to do. And he looked at me and he says, I'll get back to you. So, <laughs> I'm still waiting. <laughs> he was an individual. He was a person. How do you tell the difference in the servant songs as to whether or not it's an individual or the nation of Israel? The answer is just read the text. Read the text. Every time it's explained, it's easy to see. It's clear. When, I, when Isaiah says, and the servant will be a light to Israel. Well, what do you think? Okay. His grave was assigned with wicked men, with a rich man in his death. We know that was true. Again, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Isaiah 53 says so much about the beautiful character of our, of our Messiah. And then we come to the end of the story. And uh, a brother once reminded me, he says, you know, you don't really preach the true gospel. I said, excuse me? I said, what do you mean I don't preach the true gospel? He was Southern Baptist. I said, the nerve of you. I said, of course I pre preach the true gospel. He says, not totally. 
He says, I've been really watching what you say. I said, so where am I wrong? He says, you're always talking about Jesus dying for our sins. I said, what is wrong with that now? He says, you never, you don't talk enough about the resurrection. And I immediately said, you're right. I'll, I repent. Jesus didn't just die for our sins. He rose from the dead. dead. He conquered death. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, we understand that the, uh, the, that the Messiah died for our sins and rose from the dead according to the scriptures. What scripture? This scripture. Verse 10, the Lord was pleased to crush him. That doesn't mean God was happy. It's a word that means it was his will. Okay? The Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as an asham, the guilt offering, totally consumed on the altar, then he will see his offspring, the Hebrew word zarah, or seed. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hands. Can the word offspring or seed be used metaphorically, not to refer to human children, but to spiritual children? Absolutely, it's used that way uh, in the Bible. It's easily understood. But the fact of the matter is, is you have a dead person who's looking at his offspring, whose days are being prolonged. And the thing is, Isaiah uses every word for death in, in the first nine verses. This person is dead. You know that the person is dead, and now you read that the person is alive. Therefore, verse 12, I will allot him a portion with the great, divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death. It's clear as a bell. This person was fully dead, and now this person is fully alive. So I need your help, because you're bright, you're Canadians. At least you have a terrific uh, prime minister. But. So here's, could he run for president? Maybe, afterwards, maybe a few of us, maybe we could work out a merger. You can have the top job. Forgive me. Politics should have no role in this message. The point is, answer the question for me. Is this servant dead or is he alive? But was he dead? Is he now alive? How'd that happen? He rose from the dead. And he sits at the right hand of his father. And one day soon, he will return. Right response. And he will make everything right. Because, my brothers and sisters, the gospel is good news. Let's pray. Abba, we love you. We thank you for your word. And we pray that you might give us great opportunities to use this passage in other people's lives. But Lord, uh, we want to be a bit selfish. Lord, this morning we pray that you might help us deeply understand the truths of Isaiah 52 and 53. Lord, especially as we enter the high holiday season with the capstone of the Day of Atonement, Lord, help us to be reminded of your love and your sacrifice and all that you've done because of your grace. And Lord, help us to live as grateful people, grateful for the grace we've received in loving you, worshiping you, and serving you by bringing the good news to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. And we'll give you the praise in Yeshua's name. Amen.